by bloody powerful. All right. So there are two things I'm thinking about here. Um, number one, I'm all the stance between you and the prizes and the beer. And number two, the nice fun thing about this is we put this on the very, very end. So all of you guys who are driving or getting on buses or some of us who are getting on, getting on planes on the end, this is going to be something to think about. Keep you busy for a while. So I'm going to run through some of these slides. You guys got questions, stick your hand up. I'll try and see it. Otherwise, grab me at the end and we'll kind of go from there. Um, I'm keeping it fairly high level for obvious reasons. We gave a talk last year at B-Sides um, in Vegas, and about two weeks after we gave the talk, some bright sparks decided to stack the mass transit buses up on the strip, less than a little common socks. So we're going to have a little bit of fun on this one. Um, it, again, it all comes down to data. We're in InfoSec, it all comes down to data. The use, misuse, abuse of data, not by us, but by the people that are actually meant to be looking after it. So, we're going to have fun with trains, we're going to talk about cars, we're going to talk about lorries, and then I slipped a couple of slides in from DEF CON a couple of weeks ago where we talked about airplanes, and then the last three or four slides talk about guided munitions and missiles and all sorts of other fun things. Including a shopping list, if you want to build your own Patriot missile. Um, yeah, think of as much. So, the context of this is quite simple. I mean, when, I, when we sit in front of executives, the guys haven't fixed the basics. Bluetooth is still an issue, wireless is still an issue, great, everybody's on Bluetooth acts, everybody's on phone, what else can we do with it? Um, we started talking to cars years and years and years ago, we started talking to systems years and years and years ago, so what we've done, we've kind of evolved it and had a little bit of fun now, and really sat and gone, okay, people aren't listening. Ford Focus, new one, um, I was talking to the person who presented at uh, DEF CON a couple of weeks ago about the, the 2011 Ford Focus that's got Bluetooth in it. BMW just announced that little bloody car that now has got Facebook in the damn thing for crying out loud. Like, what the fuck? You drive. Don't care what's up to drive the bloody thing. So I'm like, okay, what, the, what can we do with this? How much fun can we have with these things? And then all the the mass transit system. How many of you guys use the mass transit system here in town? Does anybody use mass transit? Already. America, yeah. God damn it. <laughs> it's a bus, for God's sakes. You can't use double deckers over here for crying out loud. Your bridge is not big enough. <laughs> so anyway, um, buses, for those of you little lights that don't know what the hell one of those things is, they have wireless on them, bless their little consoles. Some of them are not publicly accessible. We can still get to them. Um, why? Why would we have fun with buses? Well, number one, because it's a bus and you can have fun with it. Um, number two, I, quite honestly, the main reason is, again, most of us are in the industry. We realize that corporations tend to only think of computers when they're stuck inside the company or when they're stuck at the company's houses. They tend not to think of the systems and they tend not to think of attack vectors that come in from this area. Um, quite honestly as well, they're an easy target. Um, a very, very easy target. They're mobile, they stop every now and again, which means you don't have to chase them too much. Um, and nobody thinks about them, which means they're not very well protected. Um, the last one was an interesting one. We kind of freaked out a few people on this one. Um, I think I've watched speed too many times. So, how would you go about it? Let me ask a simple question. For those of you that maybe know the bus system, please tell me Grand Rapids has a fucking mass transit system. All right, good. How many of you guys are out? How many of you guys are outside of, of this neck of the woods? Oh, sweet. Okay, so you can go home and try this out. Good. Should you decide to pick on the poor mass transit system, um, I, the bus depot. The bus depot is probably the easiest place to start to do some investigation. Obviously, the thing is unguarded. Obviously, you can walk in and you walk into the social engineering, start talking to the mechanics, have a bit of fun with them. I don't have Jesse here with me. He was me at Falcon, and bloody good guy. He wears his overalls all the time, fits in beautifully. The other nice thing about the bus depots as well is as the bus pulls into them for the most of the bus and transit systems, as the bus pulls into the depot, the internal network, and especially the wireless network for the bus, talks to the bus depot's network and tells the bus depot's network that the bus has been driven like a maniac for the last couple of thousand miles that the driver stinks, um, and whether it needs maintenance or support. And this is all obviously done over wireless. Not very well secured wireless. How do you know this? Well, number one, you've got to pick your bus. So find out what your bus is, find out where your bus is. What you're after is for this, the engine. Because this is obviously your end target. Owning the bus, great. Stopping and starting the bus at random intervals, even more fun. <laughs> 
So how does one go about doing this? Not that I encourage this, but it's fun. How many of you guys have got the little like Sprint MiFi's, AT&T MiFi's, or any of those kind of stupid things? Yeah, exactly. Um, you'll need one of those. Well, they're the easiest and most portable. Use any kind of AP. Once you've found your bus depot, and you've associated with your bus depot, you might need to actually grab the card from the bus depot. You might need to grab uh, the various wireless SSID keys. Most of the ones that we've run into are um, wet encrypted because, well, that's all they think they need. And I'm happy with that. So now you find your parking place. Buses step on a regular, buses stop on a regular interval. So you're going to need to find your bus parking spot. Not on the depot because the damn thing gets turned off, so it means you now have no power. But where they basically park up for 10, 15, 20 minutes. At that point, fire your access point up. The bus, and obviously rename the bloody access point for crying out loud. The bus obviously now sits there and goes, oh wow, it's an access point. It's a bus depot access point. Let me make friends with it, which it considerably does. You will, hence back to this previous program here, you're going to need to figure out what engine management software you need. Cummings uses a different one from Detroit, uses a different one from the JD guys, etc., etc., etc. You can readily download this stuff again, bringing you back to data. You don't have to go and code a management interface for a Detroit engine. You can just download it from the boys on the Detroit system. From there, you've got your access point. You're running your either you're running your wireless access point. The engine management software is obviously sitting, maybe looking for an RS-232 port. It doesn't take much to actually translate that over to an IP port or something else. So now you have management access from your console into the access point. The bus associates with the access point. And hey presto, now we have a bus. <laughs> this is one that we found not too far away from here. Um, <laughs> It's a little more convoluted, but we've got an hour and I've got buses, cars, and planes to run through, so we can talk, we can have fun with it. Um, so this was a bus that we found and we made friends with. This was actually a hybrid bus. So needless to say, if the bus is running too slow, we can adjust the brake torque and obviously modify that. We can modify the bus speed limiter on this thing and the RPM torque range on the bus as well. All from sitting at the coffee shop's front. You know, basically we're sitting at the table of the coffee shop where the bus pulls up. So you basically now own the bus. Now obviously you can pull this up, you can modify the config file, you've actually got to get the bus to reboot. It's not the Windows operating system, oh, it must reboot. So you can do that, you can actually get the Detroit engine to shut down and restart the thing, it's actually kind of fun to do. <laughs> so, very, very high level, we had fun with buses. Obviously as well as doing that, you start looking into the CAN bus arcade. How many of you guys are familiar with Autosar, CAN bus networks, and everything else that runs across vehicles? So, all right, we'll keep it high level. Think of token ring network. Please tell me you guys understand what bloody token ring network is. Yes. Okay, good. All right, so CAN bus networks. Um, in a, a high and easy way as possible, it looks like the old token ring networks. The damn packet, the PID ID, just keeps running around until it finds what the hell it wants. If you inject the correct PID ID into the bus, in other words, if you ignore the management interface, and you maybe want to turn off the electrics remotely or something else, you can actually find out what the PID ID is on the thing injected in, and we did the same thing with cars, but you've got to be careful with cars because we set off the airbag in the Mercedes. <laughs> Not the most sensible thing to do, especially when you have to take it back to Hertz and go, I don't know what you said. <laughs> so, cars, okay, uh, we'll ask the question, that, that's probably another bloody answer. How many of you guys have somewhat modern cars that have the Bluetooth interface? You walk up to the damn car and it wants to make friends with your phone, your computer, and anything else you bloody have. Yeah. These are the kind of cars we're talking about. Now, some of the manufacturers will go, ha ha, we don't have the entertainment system. It's not our fault. Great, well done, boys. Some of them will go, ha ha, it's air gapped. No, it isn't. Some of them will go, oh, there's a security problem? Yes. It's all through, the, basically, the Bluetooth interface. So when you're... Bluetooth system that is on your newish vehicle or your targeted newish vehicle, same kind of same kind of attack basically on this one. It's we've chosen this, we chose this about two years ago, we've had more fun with it, we're doing more and more things with it. But when we did this a couple of years ago, we associated with like a couple of mugs and a couple of BMWs, because it was the high-end stuff that had these things. All that entertainment management system is built into the main CAN bus network. All that main CAN bus network runs your ABS. I mean, it runs your windows, 
not Windows operating system, things that actually work and can't be dead. Um, it runs the engine management system, it runs the fuel system, it runs all these things. It all runs across the on-campus network, and these bloody things are getting more and more convoluted over the days. Herein lies a very, very quick kind of check on these things. They run across different interfaces, they run at different speeds, you just basically have to pick your target and figure out where you want to go. The motor system, the panel system, and you can see on it, control area network, global network, etc., etc. Most of these things, thankfully, are controlled by a central control system that sits in here. The entertainment system handily plugs into that. Now, for the most part, when you're trying to want to associate your Bluetooth system with the car system, one of two things, one of three things will happen. Number one, it'll just make friends. Number two, it'll ask you for a pin code, which will be one, two, three, four, all zeros. Or number three, it will ask you for a pin code. You've actually got to figure out what it is. Some of the BMWs, the pin code is the last four digits of the pin number. I'll let you figure out how to get that. The fourth option, you can actually do a denial of service against the thing and actually break into it, but I wouldn't want to tell you that. So how does it work? It's an OSI model. At the root, it is a complete OSI model. It's a network model, slightly different, but same kind of concept. Um, you're looking at the app layer, data link layer, physical layer. Your stuff, obviously, here. This is where you want to look for, network layer through to the session layer side of things. And literally, you are doing the same kind of thing. And there's a couple, these slides are a little out of order, because I was messing around with them. Here, we'll actually fast forward to this one again very, very quickly. Actually, no, we'll go to this one. So, um, same kind of concept. You have, if you've picked your target, two ways of getting into your target. You obviously fire up your, you fire up your Bluetooth sniffer. You can do a Windows one to tell you what's going on. You can do a Linux one. Backtrack has three, four different Bluetooth tactiles in there these days. Yeah? Multiple, yes? Please tell me you know what the hell Backtrack is. Hmm? But, uh, somebody take that person out and keep them. <laughs> fire backtrack up, fire something up. Your whole concept on this one, and by the way, get yourself a decent Bluetooth antenna on your end. Sitting 6 foot, 10 foot, 12 foot away from your quarry is kind of going to give the game away. Um, the old USB 1.1 one ones, we've got a couple of, I've got, I haven't got mine with me, but there's a couple of Linksys ones that actually have a really good, like, 80, 100 yard range on them. And you can wrap those things up really nicely, get a good several hundred yard range. The nice thing about the car is, for the most part, it's also amped up pretty well. So you only have to get within, you know, 50 or 100 yards. We sat over the bridge in uh, stop start traffic in the middle of where I come from, Arnica, the woods, and we've associated with cars and made friends with them. But again, when you're on this system, you've broken through the system, you've made friends with the entertainment system, you're faced with two factors. You've either got to understand what the PID ID architecture is, in which point you're actually going forward to one of them, probably this one. You're going forward onto some of this stuff where you've actually got to get into the PID architecture, figure out what's going on, or quite honestly, you cheat. Back to the whole thing. We're not having to reinvent the wheel on this. We're using tools that are already out there. We're using technology that's been out there for donkey's years. It's the fact that we still have a level of security. Auto genuity makes a really nice tool. As you can tell on this one, basically it's auto detecting the serial port. I mapped my Bluetooth device driver, USB to serial mapping, and hey presto, I'm making friends with a vehicle. At this point, auto ingenuity brings up me a couple of interfaces. Top left hand side is a nice Mercedes 600. Obviously, being the fuel conservative person I am, I'll actually turn half their injectors off. <laughs> Sense. Bottom right hand side, main VW ID group, engine. Now again, same thing, what we're now doing is we're using architecture that's already in place. We're, again, we're not having to reinvent the wheel. We're using data that's already out there. We're using systems that are out there. The scary and interesting thing depends upon how you want to look at this, and we'll get into this when we start talking about missiles and airplanes. Um, all of this information is freely available. The main corporation, the main, say let's take Audi for a second, the main VWID group, yes, they build the cars. But as a third party organization, I might make the entertainment system. You know what? I want to tell the world that. But hey, we make the entertainment system, and here's what we do, and here's how we do it. And here's how it connects into the alleys. That's great. That is all intelligence that you guys can use as you do your discovery. No different than when you do work against corporations. You don't go knocking on the front door and go, Hello, who are you? You use Google Foo, you hit the onion network, the tool system, whatever it takes. You basically go and get your intel. Different than this. Same kind of thing. So, let's talk about airplanes for a second. 
This got a little convoluted, and actually the aeroplane thing came out of a car thing, and it sounds somewhat convoluted, but there's an aeroplane company out there, a nice little company called Boeing. They make a few aeroplanes. The scary thing is they've also got this proprietary network called Intellibus. Is anybody from Boeing here? I want to admit it. No? Good. <laughs> I had somebody that stood literally staring at me all the way through. Oh, sorry, we tried talking to you. So anyway, Boeing makes Intellibus. Intellibus is in aeroplanes. It's only really the start of the network. So we started digging into the Intellibus network, which started leading us to like Boeing 737s and Boeing 787s and all sorts of other things. We're like, okay, what can you do with the bloody aeroplane? What, the, what kind of network does it run? How does it run? So we started to dig again. None of this was done touching any of the corporations in question. There's no hacking, there's no breaking in, there's nothing. This is just gathering intelligence that's freely-ish available on the net. You just couldn't know where the bloody hell to look for it. So, boxes of electronics in airplanes. There are several main different sets of networks in the airplanes. Boeing's got its EDS system, Teledyne's got a load star system, you can read this as well as I can, and Telebox networks. The original sets that were in a lot of the old ones were not that easy to understand. And Intellibus, to its credit, as well as some of the Teledyne systems, have brought a similar kind of network architecture that we find in corporations. The only difference is the endpoint is not necessarily always a digital system. You've got analog systems that sit on the end of these damn things, and those are a pain in the ass to deal with. But it's a network. It's an architecture that we can talk to. The question is, obviously, how the hell do you talk to it, and where do you get to it, and how do you get access to it? And again, same thing to a degree, you go back to the net, or in this case, you go talk to the patent office. Now, we like the patent office. It is an extremely good source of information. <clears throat> Top left hand side is exactly how your Boeing airplane, 787 in this case, talks to the entire internal Boeing architecture. The middle piece of stuff that has that nice server address is some of the architecture inside the 787. It's how it communicates. If that's too thick, this actually understands the entire command structure and command architecture inside it. If you still can't bloody well get it, they break it down into the site comment and command resource for you. So if you have to do coding, here is your schematic of exactly how to code your program to interface with the aeroplane. Again, all thanks to the patent office. All easily, readily accessible information. So what does that mean in English? Well, obviously we'll set with the IntelliBus stuff in a minute. The bus master controller. You can go to the patent office, go look for the bus master controller. It runs pretty much through the entire network on these damn things, on the airplanes, and how they work and how they communicate. It is the end point of the piece, and there's primary, there's secondary, there's redundant accesses and controls inside this thing. The network device interfaces, this is how you will start to communicate with your airplane. Um, similar kind of an architecture between the Boeings, the Airbuses, um, and some of the other ones we'll mention. They got the stuff you need to focus on here, and the stuff we, we end up focusing on, as we put in there, the accelerometers and the pressure transducers. That will become aware later why. The second one down was the, the mill standard stuff. Well, you need that if you want to go play with F-15 and F-16s. Um, those have been removed because I was asked to take those slides out. But the same principle applies. So what are you going to need? Healthy appetite for research. In theory, that's why most of us are here. We don't just accept the roles and positions. We, we want to actually look at more stuff. You are going to need a lot of research. You are going to need an understanding and an in-depth understanding of how basically harnesses, testing harnesses work, how VX testing harnesses work. You can, thankfully, because again, the third-party supplier that builds the controlling interfaces for the autopilot and some of the other navigation systems has a demo testing harness you can download for the Xworks. It's very useful of them. It gave us all the interfaces of exactly how to turn the engines off, which we did. <laughs> Any questions so far, guys? Or is everybody walking home tonight? <laughs> yeah, we, I haven't got anything to hack you on the walking yet. I've got to figure that out. Oh, yeah, good point. All right, good point. <laughs> now, the last one on here is actually an interesting one. Laptop of the, the Visa Tech Telemetry System. You can actually buy one of those things on eBay now, bless them. So you don't need, again, 
this is where I have a problem. You, know, you look at data, you look at the architecture, you look at the stuff that is meant to be contained inside of an organization, and then you look at how well it's been distributed outside of that organization's control. Those of you that are inside corporations, working inside them, working to support them, working to manage them, you can't just look at the firewalls, the IES, the IPS, and assume that that's where your data perimeter is. You've got to look a hell of a lot further outside these days. Look at the vendors, look at the architects, look at the systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those of you on the pen testing side of it, open your bloody eyes as well. So, the top one. Walking up to a plane, lap it, jacking in with a cat fight, it will not work. The way we got in two different ways to the systems. We actually got in by the ground-based computing systems that are very handily when you buy your nice 787 or 737 or whatever. They send you with a whole bunch of laptops and crews and systems and controllers and ports. And then they ask you the question, so, Mr. Supplier and Buyer, how would you like this stuff secured? And you go, well, oh, let's put a 4 your pin on it, please. And they go, well, we, we probably would recommend you didn't do that. Go, well, I'm buying it, I'm spending millions, just do what I ask. And they do. So in the case of the ones that we hit, they didn't even have a bloody password on them. So it is an unpassworded Windows system, in the case of the stuff we hit. General time to access, and what, 35, 45 seconds, 60 seconds? Worst case scenario, jack in the USB drive, and all wide no run, off ground. Done. That's involved to get into the ground-based control system of the airplanes. Now, you can also, especially on some of the newer aircraft systems, most of the controlling architecture is inside the actual cockpit itself. There is some of it which is outside the cockpit, and to their credit, they've actually done a pretty good job of securing that. But you can still get into some of it. You can still mess around with some of the in-flight entertainments. And instead of it showing, you know, I don't know, something civilized, it shows Debbie Does Dallas or something on all the channels. <laughs> Not that we would have contemplated doing that. So, how the heck do you find this out? Where does this stuff come from? How do you get it? Top left-hand side, guys are more than welcome to take note of this stuff. The real nice thing about airplane builders is they don't build the damn things themselves. Not much different than uh, our friendly car builders. The nice thing about it is there's a couple of organizations out there that track who actually builds the bloody things. And handily, they post it on the internet. So if you happen to want to know, oh I don't know, where the transducers and the pressure transducers and the RTD temperature sensors are for the Boeing 7 whatever, you have to go to Meritech and go look at their architecture. So again, if you are supporting your infrastructure, and maybe you are the red team for Boeing, your problem's just got a whole lot bigger. Because I'm no longer taking you out, I'm taking everybody else out that supplies you. By the way, they're all out there shouting on the street corner, woohoo, we're doing work with this company. As custodians of the information, we have to do a better job of controlling it, a hell of a lot better of a job. Because now what happens, on the top right hand side, now we can look at the data streams, now we look at the architecture, now we know the C++ code to actually get into the Intellibus network. And by the way, this tells you how to actually build the DLL architecture. And this one over here handily tells you exactly what modules you actually need to use. So you take your testing harness, you take all of this information, and then you go make friends with the airplane. <laughs> top left hand side um, is a crate. So when you're actually loading crate, when you're loading programs, you don't just load a program, you load what's known as a crate. It's a pain in the ass and it takes a long time to explain. I think of it as an aptly named program. The top right hand side is, the, um, is the, the A6 chip that we wanted. That chip is made by a nice company over in Austria who runs a really good FTP server where they put all of their data on. It's the only time we made friends with somebody because it was an FTP server. They said, hey, come make friends with us. So we did. And pretty much so we own the entire FADEC. So FADEC is, is in the... Do you guys remember 15, 20 years ago? It was in France. Um, somebody took off a 737. Instead of it going up like that, they tried going at too steep an angle. So the engine management system said, whoa, you can't do that, and just kept on flying it like this, right into the forest. Great, love intelligence in computers. Um, that was all controlled by the FADEC system. So it basically is this bloody great big module that sits on the side of engines. Well, the nice thing about it is it tells engines what to do. So if the pilot decides to yank back or do crazy stuff like they show in the movies, the FADEC goes, yeah, no. Outside of normal operating parameters, you're not doing that. The nice thing about it is, is we can moderate, modify what those operating parameters are, which is pretty much what we did. There is a FADEC engine. 
Um, we got a couple of slides to show what we did on this thing as well. We'll have some fun with it. Uh, that's the 747 800. Uh, the 747-400 is using an entirely different type of architecture that confused us, so we went away, scratched our heads, and went after the 747-800. It was easier, it was more modern, it was a hell of a lot less hassle. Again, now the fun thing about this is everybody's like, oh, they're all in hangars, and they're all well looked after, and there's guards with guns. No, they're wrong. The nice thing about most airports is they have a private airport section. And if you should happen to dress up so, not necessarily like this, I'll walk into the private airport section and say, oh, I say, which accent's useful every now and again. I say, um, one's airplane is over there, and I'd like to let you go see it, please. If you wouldn't mind, thank you very much, goodbye. As if you own the bloody place. And you go, you, surf, go away. They do. And then you wander around to the hangar, then you go to the 747 hangar, and you have a Jesse with you, and the Jesse goes, how y'all doing? And starts talking to the engineers, in engineer speak. At which point in time, he's got those guys over there. We're sitting, actually not too dissimilar in an area like this. We're sitting in front of a console like this, and I'm going, oh, no problem, nothing to see here. And I'm making friends with the 737 we made friends with at the same time. Easy to do, five, ten minutes of social engineering, and I've now got access to a 737. I think we played with at that point. We did the same thing with the 747, and we made friends with an Airbus too, just to even the playing field. It's that easy. Not rocket science, it's actually harder in some cases to break into data centers and disease these damn things. So, just that again, level the playing field, we did the same thing with a helicopter. <laughs> the cool thing about these, they've got smart card readers. <laughs> so, and they, they have all the programming on the smart card reader. So you take out the smart card reader and you copy the smart card reader, then you put their smart card reader back in, then you go away and then you come back again, yeah, a couple of days later, and you put your smart card reader in, and they try and start the engines up and it doesn't work. Or you let them start the engines up, and at about 5,000 feet, when you've taken readings from the altimeter sensor, and you've taken readings from various other sensors around the engine, you cut the engine. And it comes down real fast. <laughs> so, we have a couple of scenarios. Let's have a little bit of fun with this. Unfortunately, somebody at b sides did the math on this for me. And we, did, we basically worked out dropping a plane, stopping the engines on a plane at 35,000 feet. We could stop the engines for about a minute and a half before the pilots were able to get the bloody thing started again. Unfortunately, the damn thing only drops about 9,000 feet. Somebody worked the math out for me, bless them. So what we decided to do is we were going to go back and reconfigure it, so we actually basically put the flaps down. And then we stopped the airplane. And then we're going to see how quickly it falls. <laughs> I bet it's a lot further than 9,000 feet. It's easy to do, guys. <coughs> Real easy. So that one, what we did on this particular crate, is that the right one? Yeah, basically what we did in this particular crate is we got hold of the FADEX system, and we figured out what all the digital and analog signaling architecture was. Now the fun thing about this is, is a lot of the analog systems, how many of you guys are familiar with the old analog systems? That are in computers? Come on, I can't be the only great bit of getting here for crying out loud. Thank you. Okay, the nice thing about some of those ones, especially on some of the more modern airplanes, is you can send a continual signal, signal loop to it, and it confuses it enough that it just stays in the same state it's been left in. So for the autopilot, if you manage to rewrite the autopilot configuration, and you manage to influence the entire architecture, because remember several slides ago I said about getting the VX works down there, getting the testing harness, figuring out exactly what you need to do, once you've done that, you build your crate, you figure out where you've got to modify, and there's the mode control panel on there, and various other things you actually have to modify on this thing. Now you've got your modified program that says, when the guy puts autopilot on, ignore the coordinates that he's put in there. Let's just focus on where we want to go. And by the way, when you've done that, this little analog signal over here, just continue to try and make friends with it. In fact, don't ever stop making friends with it. So the pilot's going, get, 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 turn this thing off, and, and nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> so this was this started off as the cornfield in Kansas syndrome, which is what CFIK was. We decided we were going to pick on a couple of airports, and, and the math on this was a pain in the ass, which is why we never got further than basically two airports, one out in Denver and then one out on the East Coast. We picked on two airports, we figured out where the main air corridors started and where they ended up putting on autopilot. Because again, this is all public information. You don't have to do much more than do research, amazing research. 
autopilot goes on at a certain altitude and it does all these things and here's all the coordinates and here's how it's meant to work. Well, that's great, now we'll modify it. So originally we were going to put it in a cornfield in Kansas. But eventually I figured out where Jesse lived. So then I programmed Jesse's coordinates in. So Jesse was going to get a couple of 787s and a couple of 747s buzzing his house. But he didn't like that and he shoots better than I do. So we went back to the cornfield in Kansas. <laughs> now, how many of you guys know Nickerson? Chris Nickerson comes out of 303, our neck of the woods. Chris is a really good guy. He's also probably a little bit more of a humanitarian than I am. My idea was basically used to fly the airplane up, drop the engines, and watch it come down, see what happened. Chris figured that was a little bit too drastic and figured out that we should probably land the airplane and, and preserve some life. <laughs> Emphasis on some life. So, again, come back to data, come back to organizations, risk. You have to be able to quantify risk. The cost of dropping a 747 is a matter of millions. You pay a million to each family and the insurance company covers the rest. Not bad company can afford that. However, should you land that airplane and through a matter of depressurization, repressurization, manage to induce hypoxia in most of the people in the back of the airplane, you've killed a bunch of them. At which point you've managed to land a perfectly serviceable airplane and killed everybody on, almost everybody on board. That's going to cost the company a hell of a lot more money. Therefore, the risk is higher. Therefore, in theory, they might listen a bit better. Kind of a nasty way of doing it, but you've got to make your point somehow or other. So anyway, with this thing, we had some fun, needless to say. The nice thing about the new Airbuses and the Boeings is that they're not sitting at like a 35,000 foot ceiling. They're at 40, 45,000 feet. So if you manage to influence the analog sensor that sits on the uh, pressure valve, there's an output valve on here, and there's a shutoff valve, which you've actually got to do a denial of service again, and there's an output valve here, and there's a few other valves you need to play with. But if you basically manage to do a rapid depressurization of the thing, it goes from 40,000 feet to about 5,000 feet in under a minute. And then you repressurize it, you do it all over again. Good way of doing it. So, I'm going to ignore that one for a minute. How are we doing time wise? We good? Not too bad? Getting close? 10 minutes? Sweet. Okay. We'll ignore that for a minute. So, while we were messing around with airplanes, any questions, by the way, so far? Apart from, is that gear on the no-fly list? <laughs> um, I know what list I'm on, let's put it that way, shall we? And that's why I've kept this at a high level. If I start releasing the code, I'd probably real fast go on the no-fly lists. But again, the nice thing about this is we can talk about this, I don't get yelled at too much, and I know I don't get on the no-fly list. Um, however, this might actually put me on some of those. This is some fun stuff. So. <laughs> So the nice thing about the companies that make all the aeroplanes and everything is I'm guessing they've got some spare time and probably some spare money, especially if they're making aeroplanes for the military, is they decide, well, hang on, we've made all these electronics, let's make some other things. So they do. They make guided munitions, missiles, all sorts of other interesting stuff. So you take the similar architecture, you take the similar methodology for research and having fun and doing all sorts of other things, and you start looking at, in this case, we started looking at the ADAC modules and some of the other modules. But you can start looking at, oh, I don't know, telemetry transceivers, um, S-band power amplifiers, and various other things on here. And you start looking at these and going, huh, wonder what I can do with one of those things. I don't wonder where it fits. So then you start looking at tactical telemetry systems. These things sit, this particular one sits on the JDAM missile system and the SRAM missile system. And there on the top left hand side is how it's architected, and there on the top right hand side is the nice interface program that the company that makes it gives you in case you need to run diagnostics on it. And there on the bottom right hand side is one that you can order from them and buy it. And you can run your own diagnostics on it. It's that simple. So the fun thing about this one is you can go back in to the company that makes these things and you can go, okay, I understand how it works, I understand what it does. How can I influence it? What can I do to influence maybe the design process, or influence the programming, or the code, or the architecture? You know, like, I don't know. It's a missile control system. How do I get hold of it? Easy. So then you go, okay, well, let's see if I can fast forward. Probably can't, we'll stop with that one. So then you start taking a look at the organization itself. 
fun part about this one is, is where you can see what this is L3 communications in this case. If you want the data, we can get it. Yeah, no shit, sure we can get it. Left hand side here, digital footprinting. I don't know how legible that is, hang on. Can you figure out who their database is? You can actually, yeah. There's their RDM master database, which is their MySQL database, which actually has all the programming controls and architectures for the entire missile system. In this case, it's the Patriot Pack 3 missile system. This is sitting on a nice open forum where somebody was asking questions about how does this PL SQL database work? And so their bright spark inside their organization posted his entire config, including IDs, passwords, IP addresses, the whole bloody lot. Yeah, that's his cotton socks. <laughs> so, what can we do? Obviously, we have the telemetry system. Obviously, we have our target database because they pull from this target database and they build off of the schematics that are in here. Well, obviously, we have to help them. So we take the target schematics and we rebuild the target schematics, including the coordinates that we want the missile system to go to, not the coordinates that it wants to go to. You can still tell the missile exactly where you think you want it to go, but it's going to ignore you, and it's going to go where I want it to go. It's as simple as that. So we had fun. We did the same thing with Tom Hawks. Unfortunately, I started with Tom Hawks, but they let him off all the ones I was playing with. It's that simple, guys. I mean, this all comes down to data. This all comes down to how organizations look after data. They manage it. They control it. None of this. And we didn't actually go in there and annoy these guys. We were going to, but we talked to them and said, hi, what do you have? And they're like, oh, that database contains all of our schematics and the programming and the architecture and the designs that we send out to the company which is based in Austria that we had the little screenshot of because we got one of the ASICs of exactly how to get into these systems. All computer systems, none of it really in offices, all architecture, all systems that are influenced. And it's all the data. It's the data the organization hasn't managed to look after, hasn't managed to control. We haven't had to walk in the front door. We've gone in through the side doors of their B2B partners, their vendors, their organizations, people that are actually basically sitting there going, whoa, we work for this company. So you, as owners of data, as you work with vendors, as you work with third-party companies, control the information, not just that you send to them, but control the bloody information that they're posting out about you. It's that easy and it's that simple. And hopefully, we'll get this lot sorted out as well. So, anyway, oh, by the way, <laughs> this is fun. Port 3389, remote desktop protocol port. Probably public enemy number bloody one, but also the easiest thing to break into a company on. So we were messing around with missiles, and what we were doing, we set loads of the military systems. Um, this is actually, I think one of these is live in the middle of being fired, and the other one's about to be fired. Um, the entire missile architecture running on a Windows system. <laughs> it was fun. We got yelled at for that one. <laughs> Guys, any questions? I, I've kind of gone through so much stuff in a high level. Um, we had fun. Uh, more questions, more anything. Any questions, guys? Oh, come on, for crying out loud. Somebody wants to code or something. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> Five under the table or a free beer. I'm good for it. All right, guys. Thank you very, very much for being an attentive audience.